Good morning, church. <laughs> my name is Gavin Stoffberg. Uh, my sermon this morning is titled, A Call to Abide. And I just want to show you my family. I've been in show for about, for about 10 years. That's my beautiful wife, uh, my son, Noah, and my daughter, Sarah. I've been in show for about 10 years now. And this, they are really the fruits of my relationship with the Lord. I got saved at Bible school, coming to one of the free lessons and and they obviously, they made the invitation, if you're coming to Bible school, you might as well come to church. And I decided to, let's go see him. And my life has never been the same after that. So I want to start with Isaiah. I'm going to read a lot of scripture. There'll be some parts where I'll read because it'll be too long for you to follow on the slides. But those are not the scriptures I want you to engage with. The ones that are on the slides are the ones I want us to really engage with. I will be reading of kind of the garden in Gethsemane as well as the cross, just to remind us, to let us go back to that place because I think we so often, not even we, the world, the marketeers are really wanting to commercialize this day. They, they've, they've turned Easter into, you see it all around you, I don't have to say that. But so, and, and this is a day that we must, we must fight for in our hearts. We must fight for to hold this moment precious because this is what it was all about. God promised in the garden already that he would send Someone to bruise the serpents, to crush his head. Moses, through the Exodus, he said that he was going to raise up another prophet like Moses and the people must listen to him. And then Jesus came in the fullness of time. So in Isaiah 53, I think we all know it so well, but let me read it. And I read through the scriptures slowly because I want us to really listen to it. Because this is the word of God and the word of God changes us. I am just an instrument I've done my best to prepare, but it's the Holy Spirit that's going to touch us and move us. And he's going to reveal Christ to us. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. And we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Some quick things I wanted to talk about the Trinity. We think of God... Often we wonder, especially when we just get saved, what, what's the big deal with, with why did Jesus have to come and why do we have to respond to him? And we forget what he's done for us. We forget who God is. God, the Trinity, they've always existed. They're never born. They'll never die. And in the Trinity, they've had community. There was Father, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So they've always been a family. They've always known perfect. I think it's on the slide. But you know, They've always been, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit have always been in perfect harmony and relationship. They never knew strife. There was no selfishness, never envy, never bad attitude in the Trinity. They had perfect love flowing between them for all of eternity. They needed nothing from anyone. They are perfect. They'll always be perfect. So why does God, why did Jesus have to come? He didn't need us. So the cross is so much more than just God coming to find, to save us poor sinners. God was inviting us into that relationship. God was looking for a bride for his son. He wanted us to be more than just his creation. He wanted us to be part of him in a way that no other created thing could experience. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, I want us to go there because it is one of those moments where we see Jesus, Jesus casting out demons, Jesus teaching, Jesus unafraid of people who want to stone you. But now when he goes to the Garden, we see a different side of Jesus because he knows what's coming. And only the Holy Spirit can give us a glimpse of that. And I pray for that. And as I read, that we get a glimpse of it. 36, I'll start with, then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to the disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. 
Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, my father, if this cup, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. Now I'm gonna, just before the crucifixion. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters and they gathered the whole battalion before him and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand and kneeling before him, they mocked him saying, hail king of the Jews. And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put, on his, own clo- put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. On the cross, and those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads. The riders expressed like contempt, ridicule, and saying, You who destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests and the scribes and the elders mocked him, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself, he is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. And now the death of Jesus. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, Lema. Sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So on the cross, the crucifixion, it's gory, the disciples are scattered. They know where. The women are there. John's there. All their hopes, ambitions, of a ruling and reigning with Christ is smashed. Jesus is hanging on a cross naked. He is a curse. But in that horrible, horrible injustice, we find sweet, sweet embrace. The greatest exchange, his life for our lives, he was bruised and crushed so that we can be embraced and made whole. He was bound so we could be loosed. He was condemned so that we could be set free. He was forsaken so we could be saved. God looked away from him and looked upon us. He died so we may live. He gave us his righteousness, access to the Father, his perfect obedience, his position in the Trinity he even offered to us. We are seated with him now in heavenly places, his sonship and his covenant. And obviously I said continue because they are still writing books about the crucifixion. They are still writing books about the resurrection. They are still writing books about Jesus because we will never stop. We will never stop. We don't have a clue yet. And as God reveals this to us through the Holy Spirit, through books and amazing teachers, we get a glimpse of it, but we will never understand God's worth and where we were and what he did to come down into earth, into this world, to put on flesh, to bear our sins, to be bruised, to be cast aside from God. We will never understand that. And so I know this is the uncomfortable part for some of us. It's like, yeah, yeah, Jesus loves me. <laughs> but you can't get to the love part unless you go through this part. There's no embrace for us unless there's the cross. There's no embrace. There's no wholeness for us. There's no hope for us 
unless Jesus dies, unless we recognize that he dies, unless we see why he died, and unless we respond accordingly. The resurrection, obviously now the disciples are scattered. The women go to the tomb and they find out from the, from the angels, Jesus is not there. They must go and tell Peter and the disciples, they must go to Galilee. They must go, Jesus is going before them. Peter comes and now this, you can just imagine the excitement. They come there, the tomb is empty. They probably, their heads are still spinning. They're afraid, they're running from the Jews. The tomb is empty. They probably, things are going through their mind. They're remembering the last supper. Jesus said he was gonna die, he was gonna raise again. Where is he, where is he? He was gonna rise again, where is he now? And Jesus holds him in, in, in this tension. The disciples leave. Mary's still there. Mary sees Jesus. She doesn't know what Jesus is. She thinks he's, it's the gardener. And she asks Jesus, the gardener, where have you laid him? And I think in one of the most beautiful pieces of scripture for me, she tells the gardener, which is Jesus, Tell me where you've laid him, and I'll go fetch him. She's a woman. What resources does she have? But she loved him. She loved Jesus. So the resurrection proves his divinity. Now all of a sudden Jesus is alive. The disciples are learning about it. But what does the resurrection prove? The resurrection proves a lot. A lot. The resurrection proves that Jesus is faithful. The resurrection proves his love for us, that God would not spare his own son to restore that relationship for us. The resurrection proves that God is able, that the promises of God, where Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I'm the life. Let's be honest, doctors can heal you. You know, we can feed 4,000 people, 5,000 people, we just do a few things. We can do those things with some effort. But coming back from the dead, that is the other thing. These people saw him crucified. They marred him. And I think one of the best depictions I've seen of that is in the Passion of the Christ of Mel Gibson. I want you to see if you've, if you've watched it. Just go to that, that scene. Jesus has whooped. His body's broken. Now think of it. The devil was all in that. He would have whooped Jesus. All his hatred he would have poured in through that Roman soldier. Because he hates us, he hates God, he hates what God stands for, he hates what God wants to do. So Jesus bears this for us, but the resurrection, and Jesus wearing those scars, doesn't he move the scars? Because what the devil tried to do, the devil will always lose. In your life and my life, he will always lose. Romans 8, 28 assures us of that. He thought he was going to snuff out the light of the world and the light of the world comes out even brighter. And his resurrection proves that we can have life. The resurrection proves because he rose, we rise. Because he rose, we don't have to be afraid. So the resurrection is the final, you could say, this is it. We don't follow cleverly devised fables and tales. This is not a self-help group, <laughs> not at all. This is people who gather in Jesus' name, accepting his sacrifice for our sin. This is Jesus who made a way for us so we can repent, so we can know the Father, we can know the truth, and that truth can set us free. So, if we go to John, 1 John 3, it says, you know, we might ask, so why, why, did, why did God send Jesus? Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, and he is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. And he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. So this is the crux of my message is going to come now. The resurrection is there. Jesus is alive. 
Jesus tells him, go to the upper room. I'm going to send you the promise from the Father, the Holy Spirit. God pours out the Holy Spirit. We see Peter, afraid, denying Christ, now preaching to 3,000. He's preaching, he's bold, because the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is the Spirit of power. He's the one who makes us witnesses. He makes us stand. He gives us wisdom. He helps us understand what Christ did. He helps me read the Scriptures. Without the Holy Spirit, we waste our time. Without the Holy Spirit, this is a self-help group. Without the Holy Spirit, we cannot understand what Christ did for us. Without the Holy Spirit, we cannot lay hold of the promises. We cannot lay hold of the life. Without the Holy Spirit, we basically where we were before Christ came. So I just want to pray, because Lord, I pray for this, Lord. I thank you for the grace in your word, Lord. I thank you that this is the message you want to give us as a church and as a body. And I thank you, Lord God, that your word is life and there's grace there. And your word, Lord God, only you can, exp- can open it for us. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'll open it for us now. Help us understand and help us draw near to you. We thank you for the cross. So I have a caution for us. This is what I feel God wants to share with us. We are so busy as a church and as a body, not just our church. I think the church of Jesus Christ is way too busy. We've got programs, we've got video streams, we've got teachings, we've got all of these things which are amazing. But God wants us to slow down and he wants us to check our fruit. John 15, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you. Unless you abide in me, I am in the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, He it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. I'll read it again. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. All the fruit in our lives comes from abiding. The fruit that has eternal value comes from abiding. It does not come from going to courses. There's a place for that. I'm not discounting that. And so it's important that remember that the word of God gives grace. Jesus tells us there. He wants us to abide. This is while he was still with us. Abide in me because he's telling the disciples already and us. Abide in me. You are expected to bear much fruit. You will bear that fruit if you abide in me. So God wants our works and our fruit to flow from a relationship and not performance. God doesn't want our fruits to flow from our abilities. Some of us are more gifted than others. Some of us have got amazing degrees and God's gonna use you with those degrees because it opens doors for you and it allows you to serve. But that is not the only fruit God wants to, to bring through your life. And God does expect fruit. And I think, yeah, this is where even I, I'm gonna read a few scriptures for us which I find very challenging. And they're challenging if we lose sight of this one. So remember this one, abide in me and you will bear fruit. Matthew 7, 21, 23, I never knew you. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. John 15, again, abiding. Keep that in your mind. Matthew 25 The ten virgins. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps as the bridegroom was delayed. They all became drowsy and slept, but at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered saying, since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. 
And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. There was another one that I didn't add, but I'll just quickly read it from, it's also in Matthew, it's in Matthew 25. This is when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you? Or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. These are hard scriptures. I like the other parts. Be honest with you. These are hard scriptures. And if it wasn't Jesus' words, I'm sure if the Bible was a a man-made book, they would have left this part out. Because how do you marry this with the rest of the scriptures? There are promises, but now how does this fit in there? But now this is what I know from my life. You need the whole truth, not half the truth. Half the truth profits you nothing. Nothing. So this is the counsel of God. This is God telling us what he expects of us. In John abiding, he tells us how we are to bear this fruit. So on your own, if you're just reading this without the Holy Spirit and you think you can do it on your own, I believe we will be afraid and we will fall into works and there will be no grace for us because we must bear fruit, we must feed the hungry, we must, and we will birth a thousand ministries. God's not looking for ministries He can send donkeys to speak to people. So why? It's not so that we can just do works, but our fruits demonstrate that we know him. Because as he is, so will we be. So we need to remember this. We need to hold this tension in our lives. And what's great is shofar can't give you works. We can't give you a certificate that you will show to the father (laughs) at the end of time and say, yeah, so and so, this was his, he did well. So his works certified by shofar. It doesn't work like that. That's why the Holy Spirit through the word will convict me and you. I sit under this with you. We want life. We want the real life, don't we? Then we must take the whole counsel of God. And if you're feeling condemned right now, stay in your seat. The Holy Spirit is here to take away that condemnation. Because he did not come to condemn us. He came to set us free. There is no fear in perfect love. But we must settle this. God expects fruit from us. At the It's Time event, let me give you, I was there last week. I think it was last week. Eh? And I was there and Pastor Angus says, uh, God says that this will be the flower of Cape Town. Now I know a little bit about Mitchell's Plain. I know that is one of the roughest, probably the roughest area of Cape Town. And as, I, as he said that, it dawned on me, is that not just God? Would God not do such a thing? Would he not do that? Just think about it. I thought like, duh, Gavin, why are you surprised by this? But I was surprised and I was not because the Holy Spirit helped me see this. This is the works of the Lord. He's going to go to the darkest, most forsaken place. 
overlooked place and he's going to say, here I will shine my light. Here I will gather a people to myself. Here I will bring out beauty from ashes. Here. And you think like, yeah, and calling out the gangsters. And it was a beautiful moment. If you're there, if you can watch it, please watch it. It's a beautiful moment. Where Wom Angus calls them out and says, you're going to have a Bible now. You're going to go and preach the gospel. That, your true calling, that's what you're going to walk in now. Because think of it. These gangsters are leaders. They're just leading in the wrong place. And they need somebody to show them, no, no, this is the way. You need to repent and turn around. How beautiful and simple the message was at its time. It was beautiful. I don't know if people go there looking for something profound. <laughs> we must repent and turn back to God. We have departed. Turn back to God. Jesus made a way, except his sacrifice. It's that simple. But here is the rub, people. In the simplicity, the pride cannot receive it. In the simplicity, you cannot receive the abide scripture. If you're proud. Because I must bring something. I've studied for 10 years. I've got a degree. I've, I've have so much life experience. How, was, how, can I not, how can this not be on my resume? How can it only be the sacrifice of Christ, the blood of Jesus? But because if you think of the resurrection, again, going back to the resurrection, everything we do in the flesh, every work we do is an insult of God. It is telling God that it's Christ endured. It's great, but let me add this. It's great, but it's not finished. Let me add my part. You know, God, you know what you want to do in this community. You know what you want to do in Stellenbosch. But let me tell you about my ministry idea. We need this. Now, can you picture God the Father, the Trinity, perfect, not needing anything, giving us some of his goodness, and we wanting to defile that goodness with our good works? So it is an offense to the cross when we come with our works as the basis for our acceptance. So again, there's a subtle thing. There's a line that we must, we must navigate as children of the Lord and as blood bought, as people who've received the Holy Spirit, we must sit with God and work us out because we're going to bear much fruit, but I can't count on this fruit. And it's easier said than done. It's easier said than done. The older we get, the more we realize, shoo, man, I am not what I think I am. When we get children, we realize it all anew. And God in his mercy gives us these amazing things in our lives. We go through trials, we go through tribulations, and we realize who we are, what is inside. But then we also realize who God is. And this is what this is about, this life. This life is about God. This life is about an invitation that was made before the foundation of the world, the foundation of the world. Before we were born, he made this. He says he's prepared, prepared good works for us. That we will walk in it. We don't need to strive. We just need to abide. So for some of us, that will mean stop what you're doing. If the Holy Spirit tells you, go home. Go home and love your wife. Go home and look after your children. Leave the corporate ladder. Stop with your ministries. Go into the closet and ask the Holy Spirit, what does he want from me? The fruit God wants from us will only come through intimacy, through the Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to give us things. He wants to give us secrets, strategy. But more than all of that, he wants to give us his heart. Jesus said he came to show us the Father. They had the five books. They had Moses. They had the Psalms. They had those books. But they did not know the Father. So again, while we can't, be on, we can't move beyond the Holy Spirit. And our trainings and our teachings and our seminars and the amazing anointed preachers on the internet, I think they're deceiving us in a measure now. Because it's their revelation that they share with us, and I'm sure out of the goodness of their heart, then we think it's our revelation. And we throw that around to one another like, you know, like we know something. You know what somebody else knows. You know what God is talking to another church about in another town, in another season. And that's why I think for me this message, I believe, is because now it's time. It is time. It was a prophetic act last week. When God moves now, we're going to see him move in amazing ways. And if we are watching the fruit, we are going to miss him. Just think about it. Does God want any of his children to miss him? No. He doesn't want us wandering around, having speaking engagements, writing books, 
getting on the radio when we should be working in the field because we don't understand his heart. We don't understand the Holy Spirit. So it is time for us to come back to the Holy Spirit. It is time for us to turn our hearts back to him. It is time for us to walk away from our works and say, Lord, if this is of you, it will live. This will prevail. God doesn't need us to finish his work. And as, as children, I think as we grow in our maturity, we realize this, the world goes on. If I leave my job, they'll find someone else. But our families, we are irreplaceable. You are irreplaceable. God will miss you if you're not in this house. If you, if you leave him, he'll miss you. There is somebody who knows your name. There's somebody who cares about you intimately, knows the hairs on your head, knows where you're going, knows you're coming and you're going, and loves us. Loves us. So I've used up all my time. The parable of the ten virgins. Both groups appear to be ready on the outside. Were virgins, they had lamps. They had lamps. Both were waiting for the bridegroom. They heard the call. Only one group had the flask of oil. Who told them to take a flask of oil? That was the Holy Spirit. In our lives, I don't know if you've got oil. I see your fruits. I don't know which of those are born in the flesh or which are born in the spirit. You know. God knows. God's word is there so that you can discern where am I? Where am, I am I building with the Lord or am I building for the Lord? And this is a hard message, I know, but it's grace. God doesn't want us to build where he's not building. When he comes into our town and into this nation and he comes in his fullness and who he is, he doesn't need us occupying his seat because we don't understand our place. It's important that we understand that God wants us to partner with him. So the power ministries as well, they prophesied in the name of Jesus. They cast out demons. They did many mighty works in Jesus' name. We, I believe, would have viewed them and said, that is it. I want some of that. I'm going to go to that teacher. He's going to teach me. I need to get sign up with that course. And there's nothing wrong with that, people. Just think about it. God uses the supernatural. But do you think God wants you to flow in the supernatural if it's going to make you misunderstand him? If it's going to make you want to start your own thing, God came for a people. He's gathering. He's not looking for superstars. And our pastors have been saying that now. He's no longer. The time of the superstar is over. There's one that we worship. And we can worship him to our heart's content. And the more we focus on him, the more we make him the center, the better we are. Psalm 116, verse 7 says, Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. Psalm 27, You have said, Seek my face. My heart says to you, Your face, Lord, do I seek. Romans 8, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the heart knows what is the mind of the Spirit. Because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose. If we see today, if you're going to listen to this, God speaking to you, that's grace. That's His invitation. The resurrection. I've shown you that I will do what I said I would do. This basically means everything that Jesus said is the truth. Not that we doubt it, but so that you know. It is the truth. He expects fruit from us. There will be some who will not be allowed to enter. Because they practice lawlessness. That form of lawlessness was they did what they wanted to do with the gifts God gave them. I pray that none of us will fall to that deception. Our gifts are meant to serve and to edify and to bring glory to God. And we need one another in this regard because it's so easy for us to get sidetracked. And I want you just for a moment to recognize that. We are children, like children when it comes to the schemes of the enemy. We fall for his ploy so often. 
and you need your brother. This church is built on small group, a group of believers where we come together, not perfect, not designed to be perfect, but we help one another, seeking the Lord, because God knows we need help. God knows that we need leaders who are bold, who are faithful to God, who loves God more than they love their calling or their job. And that we see with our leader, Pastor Sias. God called him to a sabbatical. For those who know Sias, knows that he naturally just does work. He can have fruit. Eh? And I mean, he does it effortlessly. But Sias is not deceived. He's not confused because he knows who he's doing it for. He's walking in obedience. So when God calls him and says, okay, I want you to be with me alone now, he can leave it because he's not building towers of Babel here. He's not building ministries. He's not trying to sign book deals. And all over the world, there are churches like that. There are pastors who are faithful to the call of God in their lives. And my encouragement and my exhortation to you and to me is to find those pastors. Find them. Submit to them. Slot in with the church. Commit fully. If you're not fully committed, you're not going to fully receive what God wants to give you. That's just how it is. Just think of it as well. God sent Jesus because he was looking for a bride. Jesus is our bride, which is a foreign concept for a guy. I've tried, honestly. It's like, this is a bit weird. I tried to explain to my son that, and he caught me. He said, but daddy, I'm a boy. And then I peddled to something else, and I changed the topic, honestly, because I didn't know how to finish that one. But now, don't you want a husband, woman, who demonstrates his love to you? When a going gets hard, he doesn't get going. He stays. What he says is what he does. Even when we deny him, when we are faithless, he remains faithful to him, to who he is. This is the God we serve. So there's mysteries in the kingdom. There's mysteries in the Bible. So let us not, it's the truth. But those mysteries can be known. Do the hard work. Sit with God. He wants to talk to you. He doesn't just want to talk to the pastor. And I think as well with the internet preachers, there's amazing teachings, people. But is that teaching for you now? That's what I want to ask. Is that what you must do now? I know I struggle with the same thing. You get saved. God, I'm going to show you you made a good thing here. Good choice. I'm going to show you. You did a good thing. I will do my best. I will pray. I will go to intercession. And I will do and I will do and I'll go for all the trainings and I will be the leader God wants me to be. And then you get offended when things don't go the way you want. Then you get offended when God sends you on missions and all your stuff comes out. It's like, why? Why am I not as anointed as the rest? And now... The reality sets in. You're not who you think you are. And then the reality sets in that God is even more faithful. He loves us even more than we know. So without the love of God, this is all wasted. If you can't trust God, if you can't trust the Bible, if you can't trust the resurrection, you're wasting your time here. I'm going to be straight with you. You're wasting your time. If you can't believe that God is who he says he is and he will do what he said he'll do, you're going to be a flaky Christian. You're going to be ruled by trauma and confusion and everything is going to knock you and you're going to be knocked to the left and to the right and it's going to feel like the world is caving in and where is God? But if you believe him that even the storm is sent by him for a purpose, if you believe him that this is where you must be, wherever you are and whatever church you are, that is where God's called you, if that's the call that God's given you, then the storms take on a different meaning. I see so little of us, and, and I, I don't have a lot of time to spend thing on the internet anymore, but there's so little of us. How do we endure the suffering? How do we cheerfully give away from what is ours? How do we, with joy, allow people to, to use us and to take from us? Because that's what they did to Jesus. They took healing from him. They pressed about. They took things from him. They wanted, they sat under his teachings. No intention to commit to him. None. They loved the teachings. He was a power broker. You know, demons would fly and you can do all of that. But how many of them would sit, would submit to them? And now Jesus tells us as well, he wants us to move away from our emotions. Our emotions have its place, but he wants us to love him with our will. 
when we're still young and we're growing in the Lord, and even as we are children, we think love is the feeling. I love them because I feel it. That's not the love. That's the feeling. And God wants to take us beyond that. It's time that God moves us. He wants to move us beyond that. He wants to call us to himself so we can stand, so we can endure, so we can cheerfully allow people to, to rob us. But they're not robbing us. We're just giving it to them. So we don't fight for titles, for, for land, for, for, for prestige, for honor, because Jesus didn't do any of that. And so we're not going to do it. But without the Holy Spirit, we cannot do any of those things. Without the Holy Spirit, you will fight for your rights. You will say things like, what about me? You're going to say that. Without the Holy Spirit active in your life, you're not going to understand when God comes. And so again, I want to end off with Matthew 11. Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you a rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So it is a hard message. But I hope that you will be edified and built up on the inside. And I know God will confirm and break this open for you as you go and as you sit with him. Because he is coming as he promised. He's going to pour out his spirit. I was thinking when I saw those gangsters go up there, no longer gangsters, but at the time, how many of us would go and submit to their ministry when God makes them the leader of the church? I mean, they don't sound like this. They've got no credentials. How many of us are going to flock to these people and say, I serve you with my degree, with my business. I will support your ministry. We will if we are in the spirit. We will. We will understand what God is doing in this time. If we are in the spirit, if we're listening to God, and again, this in the spirit is not a spooky thing. My altar call will be for those who want to hear God clearly. If you're struggling and you know you don't know God, please come forward so we can talk to you and pray with you and let God take away your sin and remove the reproach. And let him give you his spirit and come and live in your life, in your heart. Take over your world and turn it upside down so you may bear fruit, fruit that will abide. But if you know that you've been striving, if you know that you're prone to that, humble yourself. Humble yourself wherever you are. We'll be in front to pray with you and call on the name of the Lord. But humble yourself. If you want to get to know the Holy Spirit in an intimate and real way, He is a person. And too often I believe we're okay when the pastor or our cell leader or that person knows what God is saying. That's not God's heart for us. Often we were at intercession, somebody was praying elsewhere and they come here, then other people are praying what they've prayed. Why? Because it's one God. God wants to do one thing in this church in the spirit. So all of us understand. But if we're not plugged into the spirit, we're going through stormy waters and God is leading us into the promised land. It's like, why are you in stormy waters? Oh, we're about to eat stormy waters, but you're not prepared for it because you're not plugged into the spirit. And so for the young men and women, I want to encourage you, use your energy wisely. Because the yields are coming. And if you're not listening to the Holy Spirit, you're going to run the, the wrong race. You're going to sprint when you should be jogging. But God doesn't want any of us to fall by the side. He did not come so some of us could fall aside. He said it, no one can snatch you out of my hand. No one. Which means Satan doesn't have that much power. So with our obedience, we will lay hold of this. With our obedience, we will abide. With our obedience, we'll take the pace that God sets for us. Thank you.